And I see you folks arranged for some nice, cool weather for us. You know, we appreciate weather like this down where I come from, down in Columbia, down in Florida. Why don't we just have everybody stand up for a minute? And uh, we don't have time to introduce everyone. And I know there's a lot of people from out of town. Why don't you just turn around and introduce yourself to the people immediately around you? Hopefully the Lord will use this time to kind of renew acquaintances and make new friendships as the weekend progresses. I just wanted to say a word about the books we have at the back. They're all uh, on a free will donation basis. It's uh, There's no set prices. Uh, if you uh, need some of the books and don't have any money, you feel free. And uh, we're, we're not here to sell books, but they are available. The um, <clears throat> number of years ago, down in Bogota, Colombia, where I was uh, serving as a missionary, someone handed me a book that was spiral bound and rather thick. And he said, uh, read this. And the man who wrote it is in Minneapolis in a place called Becky's Cafeteria. And he knew I was going to Minneapolis on a trip and said, stop in and see Brother Clayton, and he will enjoy your visit because he's a man who has Columbia on his heart. And uh, little did I know, but that was uh, beginning of a friendship and that has become more than a friendship because it's it's been a joining of our hearts in ministry where the Lord had placed Columbia on my heart from a very early age. As many of you remember, when my dad was up here in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, working on some radar stations for the U.S. government, and then we went back to Minneapolis. And the Lord spoke through me as a four-year-old to be the one who really pressured my dad to become a missionary and to go to Columbia. And as a four-year-old, I prayed that God would call my parents to be missionaries so I wouldn't have to wait till I grew up. Because the Lord had placed that on my heart. And through the years, He's been defining that word missionary. That word missionary. Missionary is someone who's sent. It's very similar to the word apostle in Scripture. And... Um, I was reading where the Apostle Paul was saying that he is qualified to be an apostle just like the others, just like the 11 that were in Jerusalem, because he had also seen the Lord and been commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ to do a specific task and to take a message to the Gentiles. He was the apostle to the Gentiles. Gentiles means the ones that weren't Jews, that weren't converted, that weren't circumcised. You know, so many have gone forth in our day and age in the name of the Lord without ever having seen the Lord, without ever having been sent by Him, without ever having been commissioned by Him for specific task and duty. And we look and we wonder why the church is in such a desperate state. And I believe that God is about to do an end time move of His Holy Spirit to close this age of the church. And I believe we're going to see apostolic ministry restored, the like of which has never been seen since the days of the early church, and I believe it will go above and beyond that. I believe that there are going to be some apostles raised up by God. Not that we don't have people in apostolic ministry today, and I'm not trying to belittle anyone who's moving in apostolic ministry that is planting and, 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 and building in the name of the Lord. And there are many men of God who I deeply respect who I would call apostles in the Lord. But I believe that we're going to see an apostolic ministry raised up in these days that goes above and beyond anything that this church age has seen up until now. I believe that there are going to be some apostles that are going to go forth that have actually seen the Lord and been commissioned by Him. We have a number of people come into our ministry from time to time talking about that they saw the Lord. Um, one girl, she said, uh, yeah, she saw the Lord. Well, what did he look like? 
Oh, he was dressed as a Catholic priest. What did he say? Oh, he said that we should all go back uh, to our Catholic church and take all our Protestant friends and pray rosaries every day. Hmm. And um, the mother was very thrilled that this girl was having such revelation from God. Uh, but my wife asked her a question. She said, well, how is your daughter living? Well, that's, that's why I called. Really, it's this problem that in spite of all these revelations, she is still has some major problems in her personal life. She's, we don't know what to do with her. But she's seeing the Lord Jesus Christ. Is she really? Is she seeing the Lord Jesus Christ or is she seeing a counterfeit? In the Revelation, in the book of Revelation, the Apostle John saw the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the one who was the beloved the apostle who was maybe the closest to the Lord Jesus Christ is in his ministry here in flesh and blood. And when he saw the glorified Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 1, he fell at his feet as though dead. The apostle Paul, on his way to Damascus, saw the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was an experience he'd never, ever forget. He was blind for three days afterwards. Friends, when you see the Lord Jesus Christ, it, it'll leave a mark on you. When Jacob came face to face with the angel of the Lord, and even though he struggled and wrestled all night, and obtained the blessing of God, but he limped for the rest of his life. God touched him in his thigh, and the way that he was walking according to his flesh changed. And God changed his name. And began to move him forward in another walk as Israel with the name of God on him. God's problem has been that those claiming to be his people have gotten their own ideas and their own plans and their own programs mixed up with his will. And it has to be straightened out if we're going to see accomplished what is prophesied and promised in Scripture. And God will bring about His purposes over the top of all of our human endeavors and ideas and plans and programs. But I believe that He's given us and is still holding open to us a door of opportunity And it's in little out-of-the-way places like Grand Rapids, Minnesota, out of the limelight, where sometimes the Lord might have something very special. And I've known a number of you. Some of you have known me ever since I was a little boy. My parents have a lot of friends here. And we've seen the hand of the Lord on a number of you people. We've seen the Lord preparing something and bringing something just about to a time of birth. You know, Brother Clayt wrote in one of his books that the true sons of God aren't in agreement because they sat down and had a conference and had a council and uh, worked it all out. They're in agreement, though, because if they're joined to the Lord... And if he's the head, and if we're the body, then we'll be in agreement if we're all submitted to the same head. Because the head isn't going to contradict himself. And through the friendship with Brother Clayt, I later on got to meet Brother George Warnock. My mother had been reading his book since 1967. And... I went to see him and uh, spend a night with him in Cranbrook, B.C. But I didn't really know enough to ask the right questions. And I spent, I think, too much of the time talking and not enough time listening. And Brother George graciously had given me a handful of his books, 11 different ones. 
and I stuffed them in my briefcase. Shortly thereafter, instead of going up north, which I thought I was going to do, up to Alaska and the Arctic, the Lord turned me around and told me to get in the car and go to Columbia. We got in the car in Vancouver, and in four days we were in uh, Miami, driving just about day and night. And um, when we got on the plane, there was a hurricane on the horizon, and we were one of the last planes that left Miami for a good long while, because that was when that major hurricane hit Miami a few years back. And we got to Columbia, and another strange thing happened. Before I went to Cranbrook, I had had a meeting here in Ely, Minnesota, the church up in Ely, and I had my two daughters with me. And I was supposed to be speaking to the adults upstairs, and the kids were meeting downstairs. But my girls were shy, and they didn't want to go, and they didn't have any friends among the other children. But I wanted to set a good example, so I grabbed them one in each hand, and I dragged them down the stairs, just about kicking and screaming and crying, and stuck them in that class whether they wanted to go or not. And kind of uh, came back upstairs and, and continued on with my message. But you know, there was a kid with chicken pox down there. And that kid with chicken pox infected my girls. And there's an incubation period. So halfway between Vancouver and Miami, uh, our first daughter started coming down with the chicken pox. We didn't know what it was for sure until we got to Miami or already on the plane. But there was something else that I didn't know, and that is that I had never had chicken pox. And when you're... When you get chicken pox as an adult, it's not the same as when you're a little kid. It's a whole different deal. I have never been so miserable. I mean, I, I scratched inside and out. And I had to stop everything in ministry in Columbia, and here I am laid up with the chicken pox for several weeks, and the only thing I had to do was sit there and read those books that George Warnock had given me. And I, as I read them, I found myself doing something very, very strange. It never happened to me before, but I would lock them up in my desk drawer because I think it would be such a tragedy if one of these books were to get lost. I couldn't, I couldn't, couldn't bear to lose it because um, it's ministering to me in a way in which I've rarely ever been ministered to. Just every word in place. And after going through all those 11 books, the um, chicken pox ended and I could continue on. But I wasn't the same afterwards. So the wind had gone out of my sails for a number of things that I had been doing down in Columbia. And I began to contemplate the idea of translating these books into Spanish and giving them to some of the people that I knew, including 150 or so charismatic Catholic priests that I know or no of. And um, so I made another trip up to Cranbrook and got permission from Brother George, and he already had one of his books translated into um, Spanish. And the one that he had already translated into Spanish was the one that I would have planned to translate last. A little book called The Feast of Tabernacles. Because I thought it was kind of too complicated and, and maybe it should be last and we'd do some of the easier ones first. But that was the one that he had, ready to go in Spanish. And so we started with that one. And I put it out in Spanish, and I took it over, and I started giving it to some of these Catholic priests who were friends of mine. And some of them never had another good night's sleep after they read those books. I underestimated what was going to happen when that message hit. Because, you see, if you've been trained as a priest in a hierarchy type of a situation to where you become a mediator between the people and God. And then you have all of these feasts and all of these fiestas, as they're called in Spanish, and each saint has one, and there's a saint for every day. In fact, some saints, some days have more than one saint. And there's all these holidays, and all of these um, uh, processionals and special events, and they're all called fiestas or feasts in Spanish. Well, if you get that little book and find out what the real priesthood of all believers is and find out what the real pre feasts of God really are and what they mean, 
it throws a monkey wrench in the works. And I didn't realize it was going to throw a monkey wrench in their works so bad. But it did. And then one thing led to another, and we translated one of Brother Clayt's books, Beyond Pentecost, into Spanish. And uh, that followed up. And one thing, just, just things just kept, kept adding and adding and adding. And until we're in the middle of a revolution. But it's not a revolution that anybody sat down and planned. There's no headquarters to the revolution. There's no movement. There's no uh, anyone trying to, to um, find you know, what is the leadership of this thing. Can't, can't find it because it, the head is sitting at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. You can't chop that head off again. And all we are here on the ground is the feet. The feet of the body of Christ. There's a promise in Scripture. It says that there's going to be a serpent whose head is going to be crushed under the feet. And I believe that that day is coming. Maybe even almost here. I'm not going to take up too much time. I want to leave time for Brother George to share with you folks. Because you've heard me several times and you haven't heard him. But I do want to share one little thing to start this this uh, conference. It's a word that the Lord put on my heart back in Columbia. I didn't know if I was going to come or not. And I was in the middle of studying a Bible that somebody brought me from Spain. An original copy of the translation made in 1559. The original Spanish Bible made in the middle of the Reformation. The man who did it spent 20 years fleeing the Inquisition with 11 children all over Europe. One of the best Hebrew experts, but with an anointing that has rarely ever been equaled in a Bible translator. And um, the experts have spent the last almost 500 years trying to water down this translation in Spanish. But there's some places and some verses that really shine. And as I was studying and finally decided to edit this Bible and, and print it in Spanish because all of the uh, study Bibles have been discontinued. They just All they want to put out is, is paraphrase editions. There's nothing that would be the equivalent of a King James Bible printed anymore in Spanish. There's not even anything that would be the equivalent of a New King James Bible printed in, in the study Bible anymore in Spanish. And so as I was studying, I began to see that one of the things that was emphasized there in the Reformation when God was restoring the clarity of His Word was the word conversion. This fellow Casiodoro de Reina used the word conversion all over the place in the Old and New Testament. He's talking about conversion. Conversion is one of the main themes in the Scripture. God converting the hearts of His people back to Himself. The need for this to happen. The need for this to happen in each and every one of our hearts, just like Jacob was called of God before he was even born and chosen above his brother. And Jacob could have been the heir to that heritage or lineage of Jesus Christ and could have been lost personally, as were many of the kings who were descendants of David. But Jacob had an encounter with God, face-to-face encounter. He had a conversion experience at Peniel, which means the face of God. And he had his name changed from Jacob to Israel. Jacob, the surplanter, who's trying to get the kingdom by hook or by crook, had his name changed to Israel, a prince with God. God gave Jacob his name, and God took Jacob's name. God became the surplanter. And God can do it, you know, because he wants to surplant everything that's wrong in us with his own nature. Because that's what a name means. It means everything that the person is. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 30, there was a problem in the land of Israel. The fire had gone out. There was no longer any fire on the altar of God. In fact, the altar itself was broken down and in extreme disrepair. 
And in the Old Testament, when the fire went out, there was no provision for any man-made fire. If you read the book of Exodus, you'll find that when somebody decided to make some fire of their own, there were two priests that decided to, to, to have a little experiment with some strange fire. It not only cost them their lives, but it cost the lives of 20-some thousand men that followed them. And we're at a day and age when in many places, in many groups, in, 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 in many uh, so-called Christian environments, there's no fire on the altar. Friends, when there's no fire on the altar, it means you can't bring a sacrifice. If you can't, find a, if you can't bring a sacrifice, because we are to be living sacrifices, according to the Apostle Paul, we're in a pretty bad way. And the only provision to get the fire started again is God himself has to intervene. Elijah in Hebrew means the Lord is the God in the sense of the only God. Or it could have been translated God himself. And here Elijah is facing this problem. Verse 30, And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Friends, the altar of the Lord is broken down in our day and age. Everybody wants to come to God on their own terms instead of coming to God on God's terms. Verse 31, And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. Twelve stones is the order of God. It's the number that symbolizes that order. The order of God to convert the Jacobs into Israel. And it has to be God's way. It has to be God's altar. It has to be His terms. In Exodus chapter 25, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 20, verse 25, it says this, And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone, for if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. If we mess with God's terms, we're going to pollute His altar. We can't change God's terms. And God says we have to come to Him with an unblemished sacrifice. God says we have to bring everything. God says if we're going to enter into covenant with Him, that means then that we belong to Him. Verse 26, Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. Friends, it isn't that we can decide how we're going to approach God and we'll take a little step today and we'll take another little step tomorrow and we'll, 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 we'll decide that He can be our Savior today and then uh, a little later on uh, He can um, have a little more control over our lives and, and, and at some future point we might decide to just make Him our Lord. But it's totally optional, of course. We can't go up by steps. If we do, our nakedness is going to be exposed. If we try to come to God by little steps and stages... What's going to happen is the enemy is going to get in there and he's going to latch on to whatever's left of our flesh that hasn't been placed under the authority of God and he's going to make us a tremendous problem and our nakedness is going to be exposed. And the Christian church is full of people whose nakedness is being exposed right now because they try to go up to God's altar in steps and in stages. When he's saying, if you want to come to me, it's all or nothing. Now, we may not fully understand what that means. There may be things that He'll reveal to us later. There may be things that would be uncovered that when we know about them need to be laid on the altar. But He wants us to come and make an unconditional surrender on His altar. That's the Gospel. That's the Gospel according to the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, that word Gospel was used to announce a king. The Romans used it to announce a new emperor the gospel of emperor so-and-so, and the trumpets would blare and the heralds would go forth. And when that gospel sounded, everyone had to come. And they had to decide right then and there if they were going to worship Caesar or not. And if they did, they had to kneel down and swear allegiance to him right on the spot. And if they didn't, they were dealt with. That's why so many early Christians were killed. They wouldn't worship Caesar as God. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ means exactly that. It means there's only one Lord. It means when you hear it, you have a choice. You can either kneel and bow before Him and submit and surrender? 
or else you can decide not to. There's only one Lord. We can't make him the Lord. He already is the Lord. We can either accept him or reject him, but he's the Lord. Back to 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 32. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. The Old Spanish Bible is a little clearer on this. It, it makes it sound as if the two measures of seed were actually put into the altar, the trench. And why would we be talking about two measures of seed? You remember when Jesus was approached by some Greeks? Right before the Last Supper. And he gave a very strange answer. Instead of going out to meet these Greeks and see what he could do for them, he said something that was very puzzling. He said, unless a grain of seed that fall into the ground and die, it can't bring forth fruit. In other words, Jesus, before his death, what he was saying is, I can't help you Greeks now, you Gentiles now, I have to die first. To be re resurrected and multiplied in a many-membered body. And then there'll be help for you. And friends, now we've got two measures of seed. Two would speak of a corporate body of Christ. And if we're that corporate body of Christ, we also have to be willing not just to believe John 3.16, but friends, we have to be willing to be the fulfillment to 1 John 3.16. Would you like to read 1 John 3.16? That's not a favorite verse for most people in this day and age. 1 John 3.16 says this, Hereby perceive we the love of God because He laid down His life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Verse 33, And He put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood, and said, Fill four barrels with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice, and on the wood. Friends, if we're going to reestablish this altar of God, not only does it have to be according to God's specification on His terms, with whatever those twelve stones signify, without us taking a tool and, and trying to, to fix those stones up, and without building any stairs, but there has to be this trench, and we have to actually be willing to lay down all of our plans and ambitions, everything having to do with that bullock which would symbolize our flesh, even the good things that we can think of for God, all of the dead wood of our human plans and projects. In Acts, the second to the last chapter, when Paul is in the middle of a shipwreck, which is a very mm, allegorical shipwreck because I believe the ship symbolizes something having to do with the church in these last days. And this old Spanish Bible I have says that after they got done lightening the load and throwing out the cargo, and then they started chopping off the rigging to see if they could save themselves from the storm, this old Spanish Bible I have says, and they chopped off all the dead works off the chip and threw them overboard. Friends, if we're going to make it through the storm, we're going to have to start chopping the dead works off too. All that dead wood has to be laid on the altar and has to be arranged properly under that bullock of everything that would pertain to the flesh still in us. And God said to start pouring water on this thing and He told them to do it three times with four barrels of water each time. Anytime something gets meant done three times in Scripture, it's extremely important. The washing of water of the Word. Friends, there's a certain amount of cleansing and cleaning that God can do through anointed teaching of the Word of God and through applying it directly into our lives as we read His Word on a daily basis and as we minister to one another. And He wants to make sure that that's going forth. Now that water being poured in the trench and on the altar and on everything else and saturating everything, it, it also makes sure that none of that grain is going to have any spontaneous combustion. But also make sure there's not going to be any false fire in there. Because the water from God's Word is going to put out all of our best human plans and ambitions. 
can be like in Isaiah chapter 6 when Isaiah was finally touched by that coal from off the altar and said, here I am, send me. And guess what happened next? If you keep reading in Isaiah chapter 6, which you can do later on, you'll see that everything got totally demolished as a result of him having that encounter with God. And it said, even if a tenth should survive, it'll still be destroyed until all that's left is a holy seed. All that's left is what God wants planted. Because, friends, we get what we plant. We reap what we sow. If we sow according to the flesh, what are we going to reap? Corruption. But God wants us to sow to righteousness. He wants us to reap in corruption. And He said, do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And He said, do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran round about the altar and he filled the trench also with water. Very important thing in this hour in which we're in is we have to listen to what God says. My opinion or someone else's opinion is not important. What's important right now is God's opinion. And we have to get saturated with his opinion. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Friends, there's been a morning sacrifice in this church age. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. And a lot of people have said that just because Jesus died on a cross that now we can go out and do whatever we please. And that's not true. The same Jesus that died on that cross also said that if we're to be His disciple, we have to take up our cross and follow Him. Guess who the evening sacrifice is? It's a people that are willing to lay down their own plans and ambitions. It's a people that are willing to identify in the way of the cross. It's a people that are willing to come in through the narrow gate and not try and seek a broad gate. It's a people that are willing to count the cost and say to the Lord, Search me. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. Elijah didn't think any of this up on his own. And God is calling forth and preparing an Elijah company to minister in this last hour that isn't going to be doing things on their own. That are going to be going to be able to say, We've done this at your word, Lord. But I was preaching on this to some brothers down in Columbia when all of a sudden it dawned on me that this doesn't say the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, like it says dozens of other places in the Old Testament. This says Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. And there's only a couple of references to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel in Scripture. I only know of three, to be exact. You see, Israel is a converted Jacob. And God is many times referred to as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because He puts up with all of these Jacob tendencies as we try and come into the kingdom by hook or by crook. As we try and pretend that we're something we're not. And He has a lot of patience with us. But friends, now it's time for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel to manifest Himself. The God who's going to convert the hearts of His people back to Himself. And He's going to do it by fire. Because there's certain things that can't be cleansed in us through just the washing of the Word. There are things that have to be purified by fire. Verse 37, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that Thou art the Lord God and that Thou hast turned their heart back again. And the original says converted their heart back again. God wants to convert the hearts of His people back to Himself. Conversion, in the biblical sense of the word, means a total turning to God without reservation. 
It means having a heart completely for God with no mixture and no impurity and nothing pulling different ways. An end to the double-mindedness that has plagued God's people for so long. And only God can do that. If God doesn't give us the grace for that kind of repentance, we can't do it on our own. We can think we've done it. But the fruits won't bear us out unless He does it. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel is about to act. Verse 38, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. And in the Hebrew, the, the, the article is there, the God, which means the only one, none other except for Him. Because this was the problem up until now. They had Baal and they had God. And Baal is Lord's per plural with a small lowercase l instead of Lord with a capital L. That's what Baal is. Notice this. They fell on their faces. Brother Clayton and I have been running around, uh, around and seen some meetings where people were falling on their backs all the time instead of on their faces. That's covered in Isaiah chapter 28 if you want to look that one up. The drunkards of Ephraim. You can see what happens to them. When the true fire falls, people are going to fall on their faces before the Lord. The fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice. It consumed everything having to do with the flesh. And the wood... All those dead works are just gone. And the stones. Even if what we thought was divine order in our different groups and, di and, and different things that, that have some semblance of God or, uh, divine order to them. And the dust, even of our Adamic nature. And licked up the water that was in the trench. Friends, when this fire of God falls, there's going to be some major changes. Nobody's going to be able to stand up and say, you know, we were the first ones with this word. Our group has an inside track. It's all going to be licked up in the fire. The only thing that's going to be left is the fire. The fire of God. And that altar is going to be operational again. I had something to say the last set of meetings on baptism. And I believe that has something to do with it. Well, you know the rest of the story, how they killed the false prophets and how Elijah told the king that he better get home because there was going to be a storm. And the king took off and Elijah sent his servant out several times. On the seventh time he came back and said that there was a little cloud likened to a man's hand. That little cloud grew and it started to thunder and lightning and the rain came down. And then war was joined with Jezebel. God's going to raise up apostolic ministry. Ministry of the hand of God. Like never before. And it's going to thunder and lightning. And there's going to be a conflict of light and darkness. The like as which has not been seen since the days in which the Lord walked this earth. And I believe that the ministry that the Lord is raising up in this day is not going to run from Jezebel. All of these Old Testament types and shadows break down at some point. David was a perfect type and shadow of the Lord Jesus Christ until the Bathsheba incident. And each one of the heroes of the faith had their flaws. And God honestly put down everything that was there so that we could learn from it. We need the fire of God. We need to ask Him to light the fire. For the church. And, uh, 
I know we'll have fellowship with many of God's people who have come. And I'm confident God will do a work in hearts. Uh, I grew up in more or less, I'd say, Pentecost. We, our folks never did belong to any organization, but by that I mean we believed in the Pentecost experience. And I grew up in that, except <clears throat> I just say that I might need a little bit of water if someone would. Oh, good, thanks. Um, I wasn't first generation Pentecost. I call myself second generation Pentecost. But I, I would hear people talking about the fire ghost in Winnipeg, and I can still. Remember her testimony every time she'd stand. Thank God for saving me and sanctifying me and baptizing me with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And you knew there was something to it. And God used her in her own little corner to pray for the sick and so forth. So I was close to Pentecost, but I felt by the time I was a teenager, I'd missed a lot when I heard of what happened in the beginning. I mean, now there's second, third, fourth, almost five generations of Pentecost until there's hardly any semblance of what God did in those early beginnings. When God invaded the lives of men and women, then there was a holy reverence and awe when they came to meet together in his name. And the fear of God was there. And I suppose I went through a lot of backward looking, looking back, wondering what it was all about, until God began to give a little vision and hope. Because I love the Word of God, I read it many times, memorized large portions of it, and yet it wasn't the vision wasn't clear. Because somehow, with my background, there's nothing more to do. Get one, two, three experiences from God and wait for the rapture. No living hope for this life. Do the best you can, you know. Serve God, work for God, whatever. And I'm not making fun of that doctrine. I believe God is going to rapture us as he raptured Jesus. I believe he's the pattern and example. But just in passing, let me say, read your Bible. and Just read it as it is written, and you'll find that that will happen at the last trump and not the first one. God has much to do in his people till we come to that last trumpet. Because he's coming for something Come up with all the dates you like of when the Lord's coming and then wait to see what's going to happen. It's going to happen when God's got the purpose for which Jesus went away and has fulfilled it. And that is to bring forth a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or blemish or any such thing. He's coming for that. He's coming for a holy bride, cleansed and made spotless and pure. You say, well, I think this guy's right. He seems to have all the figures there. and He's coming on such a date. Forget all that. He's coming when he's got that holy people ready. He's coming to inhabit his temple. First, he comes to cleanse that temple by the fire of his presence, like Russell talked about. In a way, I lived to see a mighty outpouring of God's Spirit in the mid-40s. And I was desperately hungry, and as many thousands, millions were. And God enabled me to uh, be a part of that. I know it came to be known as Latter Rain. And got mixed up with a lot of things, I know that. And I used to be disturbed about it. For a long time I was disturbed when it seemed that for two or three years God was moving very sovereignly and Suddenly there was all kinds of kingdom building like you see today. But God did a great work in millions of lives. 
And I know that you can read the article as well. It lasted a couple of years and then it all petered out. And where is it now? It's all gone. Because God wouldn't let it become organized. And you can't point to any organization and say, what's light or rain? God didn't let it become an organization, but God did a great and wonderful work in millions of lives of people. And that's what God did, not establishing kingdoms. He didn't let those kingdoms last very long. But man is prone to build his own kingdoms. And they're doing it today and they're working hard at it. And God is coming with the fire of his presence to deal with the kingdoms of men when he shakes everything that can be shaken both in heaven and in earth. Earthquakes, yes, but the Bible talks about heaven quakes in the last days. For yet once more saith the Lord, and I will shake not the earth only, but heavens also. Paul explains what it means once more. This word yet once more signifieth the removing of all things that can be shaken. Those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Don't get disturbed. You think, what are we going to do if God doesn't rapture us when all this thing happens? God is shaking everything that can be shaken that the unshakable things of His kingdom may remain firm and steadfast. The psalmist saw it, I think, in prophecy when he said, Though the earth be removed and though the mountains be cast into the depths of the sea, and the rivers swell with the roaring thereof. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of our God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. Don't be disturbed with the shakings, but understand what God's doing. He's shaking the things that are doomed to crumble. As He comes on the scene to burn up the chaff, to shake all the works of men, that his eternal kingdom might come forth unshakable in the sight of God. God has much to do yet, and he can do it quickly. And he is going to do it quickly. Because the prophet said, and Paul reiterated in the New Testament, that God's going to do a quick work in the earth and cut it short in righteousness going to cut it short in righteousness. And the righteousness of God is going to be revealed. It's going to be revealed in His people in the earth. For that's why the Holy Spirit came to inhabit the, these temples here in the earth. That He might be a reproof to the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The church has become anything but that. And we can mourn over the church, and I believe there's a place for godly mourning over the church. And I believe that's what Jesus had in mind when He says, Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are they that mourn. Not over yourself, but over the desolation of Zion, because the gates of Zion do mourn. Because none come to her solemn feast. Because the precious sons of Zion are poured out like ashes, as it were, in the midst of the streets. Jeremiah was a mourning prophet. And after the destruction of Jerusalem, he went out and we're told he sat outside, the, beholding all the desolation that was going on and lamented. And we have his lamentations written down there in the scriptures for you and I. That when similar things happen, God might people might come to repentance. That they might begin to mourn over the desolation that's in the church. Instead of trying to make people laugh. Instead of trying to make them happy. Happy is the man that mourns. For they shall be comforted. We don't see much of that because the fear of God has gone out the windows. God wants to restore that holy fear once again into the midst of His people. Not a fear that has torment, but the fear that is impregnated with the love of God. We fear Him and we love Him so much that we fear to do anything that is not of His will. 
gone out the window. God's people and the ministries to blame for much of it. They think they can bring in anything if they can get the crowds. Bring the people in and preach the gospel to them. Any old means at all. God's going to put a stop to that. He's going to have a people gathering in His name. There's going to be holiness unto the Lord written over the foreheads of His people. Holiness unto the Lord as it was with the priests of old. On that holy mitre was written, Holiness to the Lord. Because God is coming to His holy temple, but it's not holy yet. He comes with fire to purge it, to purge the sons of Levi, that they might offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. I was greatly blessed, anointed, a new vision as a result of that move of the Spirit of the mid-40s, which became known as Latter Rain, but I don't like to use the term because just very shortly after the movement started, there was a lot of kingdom building that came out of it. And it disturbed me until I realized something as plain as can be, but I didn't realize it at the time, that God sends his rain down upon his heritage. And the psalmist spoke about it in Psalm 68 when he says the Lord has sent a bountiful, bountiful rain whereby he did confirm his inheritance when it was weary. He goes on to say a scripture that Paul quotes in Ephesians 4. He ascended on high. He gave gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also that the Lord God might dwell amongst them. A scripture that the Apostle Paul quotes and adds to it, not adding to the Word of God, but adding to that scripture, confirming what God has shown him. That when he ascended on high, it was for the purpose of giving gifts to his people. How he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of ministry unto the edifying of the body of Christ, till we come unto the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Brother David Cutsworth and I were talking about that this, this morning, I think it was. Till we come, gift and ministry is not an ultimate. To become an ultimate in the church, get these precious gifts of God and go out and minister, do the best you can till the Lord comes. It's not an ultimate. The purpose of gift and ministry it's till we come unto the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we be no longer children tossed to and fro, cast about with every wind of doctrine, speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Jesus Christ from whom the whole body fitly framed and knit together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. God's purpose and gift and ministry. And it's become a mercenary thing like the temple of Herod. God's going to cast out the money changers. He's going to purify his house with the fire of his presence, refining his people as gold and silver is refined that his people might offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. I'm not going to talk very long. We're going to, I believe Brother well, Phyllis is going to minister all. Is that right? God wants us to have vision. His vision. I know there's all kinds of people who want you to get behind their vision. God wants to impart vision to His people. He wants to impart vision. And God is faithful to do that. When His people come to that place where they realize things are in a horrible situation, a horrible mess. God knows all about it. He recognized it before you and I did. And He prepares to raise up a clear voice in the land. He's doing it again. Let me tell you, there's something that encouraged me. In times of darkest apostasy, God raises up a pure, clear word to His people. Oh, you think we need revival, we need prophets, apostles. 
in apostasy, in the midst of apostasy, God would raise up a pure voice, a Samuel, an Isaiah, an Ezekiel, a Jeremiah. And if ever there was apostasy amongst God's people, it's today, and God is preparing a prophetic voice for His people. I know there are prophets in the land, and I know that. I know there are some genuine prophets, but somehow there has not come yet that prophetic mantle that God wants to rest upon the congregation of the people where the testimony of Jesus will be in the midst of His people when they gather together for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And God's going to cleanse His temple. He's going to lay upon them that, that testimony of Jesus in their midst. Not just someone that can get up and tell about Jesus, but in the congregation of the people there will be that evidence of Jesus that will be the testimony, the candlestick in the midst of God's people and in the world. And that's the spirit of prophecy. God's going to have a prophetic people, a, a priestly people, walking in the anointing, the same anointing that Jesus had when He walked this earth, because that's why He went away, that we might have it. He sent it on high, gave gifts unto man, pours out His Spirit, upon His people that we might partake of the same anointing, not another. First John, the anointing which you have received of Him is truth and is no lie, and as that same anointing teaches you of all things and is no lie. It's the same anointing. I don't want any other anointing. We don't want that false anointing, that false fire. People are trying to make it. They're trying to make the holy oil. They're trying to change it bringing in all kinds of rubbish and putting it in the anointing oil. God says it's, it's holy oil and it shall be holy unto you. And he says, don't you dare make anything like it. I mean, I can almost get angry when I see this stuff. I saw a guy over TV. We don't have a TV. I was in a home where they had this guy on a breaking cement block with his head to show how powerful Jesus is. Let me tell you that Jesus came here to walk in meekness and in weakness. He was crucified in weakness. And in that crucifixion, He manifested a mighty display of the power of God. And it's a Lamb that reigns on the throne of glory today. It's the Lamb that triumphed. God's going to purge the church from all this kind of nonsense. You better be ready for it. God's going to do it going to have a people that will gather together unto His name that He might be glorified, that the Holy Spirit who dwells in each one of us might be that faithful witness in the church who witnesses of Jesus, who is here abiding in you and I, that He might take from Jesus and show it to you and I. The Holy Spirit's been given to us to take from Jesus and show it to God's people. Not to take from some entertainer, some guy that's got Christian rock and all that junk. To take from Jesus and show it to God's people. That's why the Spirit came to dwell in us. No wonder the Holy Spirit has taken His leave and flown out the window. No wonder the Lord Jesus is seen standing at the door of the Laodicean church asking for admission. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, I will open the door. I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. He says, you say you're rich and increased of goods and have need of nothing. That's not the church of the last century. That's the church of today. We're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And Jesus says, you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you might be rich. You know what that is? Gold, that's God. That's God's nature. That's God's gift. It's God's presence. Gold tried in the fire. White raiment that you might clothe yourself. I saw that you might anoint your eyes that you might see. I counsel thee. The Spirit says to buy of me gold tried in the fire and I salve to anoint your eyes. You say, we see 
That's the problem. We're so self-confident in what we can see, what we can study, what we can dig out of the Scriptures. With all the books of learning, we're so confident that we remain in our blindness. Jesus said, if you would admit your blindness, then you would see. Then you would have no sin. But because you say we see, therefore your sin remaineth. I'm going to close here, but I want to read a passage from 1 Samuel. I mentioned that in times of deep apostasy, God is faithful to raise up a clear voice. And the priesthood had become totally corrupt in the days of Eli. The priesthood that God had established become totally corrupt and immortal, immoral and covetous. And they were using their ministry as priests to serve themselves in their own end. And God was displeased about it and warned them about it. Nothing happened. God in the midst of it was preparing a voice that would be a pure voice to his people. And you know the story of how Hannah had sought the Lord and God gave her a man-child. And how she had dedicated him to the Lord. And God has a faithful Hannah in the earth. She's been praying and interceding to God for fruit, for fruitfulness, for reality. God has heard her cry, but God didn't hear Hannah's cry until she came to that place of total commitment. Where she said, Lord, if you will give me this man, child, I'll give him back to you. And she kept her vow. God wants to bestow upon his people great things, mighty workings, mighty prophetic utterances, a sure word. But he wants that commitment from his people, which you and I can't keep. But if we make the commitment, we can continue to pray, God, you seal this commitment and make it happen. Whatever you give me, God, I give it back to you. I won't retain any of the glory of it for myself. Oh, I know we'll all say that quite boldly, but I mean only God can take those words as we ask him to do it and cause things to happen in your life and mine that he will get all the glory. You know man, you know man is getting a lot of the glory. We recognize that. Don't blame them. Blame God's people for exalting them. Blame yourself. Then they fall, of course, God's people condemn them. When you're responsible, you're responsible to see to it that you give no idolization to any human being. Nevertheless, the ministry is responsible to seek God to know how to handle it if it happens. Jesus knew how to handle it. You say, sorry right to exalt Jesus, isn't it? Not if they were just exalting him because he was a great man or a great prophet or a great king. That's how they exalted him. They never exalted him because here's a man who speaks words direct from God's heart. But when they saw the mighty miracles that he did, and especially in, in multiplying the loaves and fishes, they got a delegation together to come and crown him king. That We need that kind of a king. When they saw he could multiply loaves and fishes, who wouldn't want a king like that? Are you and I exalting some of the ministry that God set in the church because they're able to minister bread, healing, deliverances, miracles? God tests our hearts, check our hearts. Are we exalting man for these things? God knows. And it's clear enough to those who know their God that man is stealing a lot of God's glory. And God says, I will not give my glory to another. And he meant it then and he means it now. And the reason he gave all glory to his son Jesus was because that every ray of glory that he caused to descend upon his beloved son went back to the Father in total worship and praise unto him. 
child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before, before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Then it goes on to show how God revealed himself to the little child Samuel, which means hearing. He didn't hear clearly at first. And therefore, he probably couldn't prophesy very well. Now, I'm not saying that these prophets that are speaking in the name of the Lord are all false. I know many of them have a, a word from the Lord, but you and I have to recognize there's a great mixture in it all. God is going to purge out the mixture until there's a pure voice in the land, and God's people are going to know it. Samuel had to learn that voice. Three times he went to Eli saying, and it is the voice of a man. Finally, the old prophet recognized he was hearing something from God and he told him next time he speaks that way, say, speak, Lord, for the servant heareth or thy servant is listening. God will speak to your heart when you and I come to the place you say, speak, Lord, and I'll listen, meaning I'll hear and I'll obey. Instead of going to a church and hearing a prophecy and coming home, wasn't that a wonderful prophecy? Yeah, there was three of them this morning, wonderful prophecies. What did God say? Well, I don't know, but there were wonderful prophecies. God is going to speak clearly to his people because he's after the hearts of his people. Today, if you will hear his voice, tonight, today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. And with that commitment, God spoke so clearly to Samuel that from that day forth he always knew the voice of God. God is going to speak in the midst of his people with a clarity and an assurance that you and I are going to know this is God's voice and that's not. We're not there yet. All oh, the mixture of voices. I can't sort it out nor can anybody else. God by his Holy Spirit is going to do it. And Samuel rose up to be a prophet in Israel. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that God had established that voice in the land. And they feared Samuel with a godly fear because they knew that God was speaking through that man. Let me tell you, that's coming back to the church. God's going to raise up a clear voice in the land and God's people are going to know this is God speaking and they're going to be confronted with the voice of God and the fire of God will come along too. Purge out all the trust. God wants the hearing from his people. He wants them to hear. He's going to be faithful to send forth a pure word. That's all I'm going to say tonight. Lord willing to have other opportunity during these days. But may God cause us each one when we hear his word harden not our hearts. That's our responsibility when God speaks to us. Prepare the heart. That's the purpose of Him speaking. Prepare our heart. As has happened so often, when they heard God, they didn't listen, they didn't obey. This day if you hear His voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation as in the day of temptation and trial in the wilderness where your fathers tempted me, proved me, saw my works 40 years. You're seeing, and those of you who have television are no doubt seeing right on TV, miracles, you're seeing signs and wonders. Oh, a lot of it might be phony, but there's genuine miracles taking place. But that doesn't mean that God's, the hearts of God's people are right with him. God says, I bore with my children in the wilderness for 40 years and they saw all my mighty works and they never came to know me. You can behold all the mighty works of God and not come to know the voice of God or not come to know him. 40 years he bore with them. Showing miracle after miracle after miracle. Every day. Every day they saw a miracle. I've heard one man say, ask for a, a miracle from God every day. They had a miracle from God every day for 40 years, and God says, they haven't known me. 
God help us when we hear God's voice to recognize He's after our hearts. He wants to change our heart. And He'll come and He'll speak to us things that I have not seen or ear heard. Haven't entered into the hearts of man. God bless you. Lead you by His Spirit. Heart of hunger. Father in heaven, I pray that you would, in this, even in this room tonight, grant that prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed, grant that it might be fulfilled. That God would give unto them the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of their understanding being enlightened, that they might know what is the hope of his calling, what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards those that believe? The power that he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and name, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but that which is to come. Anoint our eyes with that holy eye salve, Lord, that we might begin to see what you're showing and hear what you're saying. That your sheep are no longer tossed to and fro and chased from this sheepfold to another looking for some kind of food, but you said you would lead your sheep by rivers of living water. Come forth, O oh Lord, we pray. Speak clearly, even in these days that we're gathered together. Speak clearly by your Spirit that there might be an impartation made in the lives of God's people here assembled tonight. We might learn your voice and walk with you and serve you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.